Okay, so um, thank you so much. And over to you then, Mark. Uh, thanks very much, um, Spencer uh, and, and Joe, and uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm very uh, delighted to, to be able to share um, my, uh, my, my research with you. Um, before I start, uh, I just want to kind of uh, give a disclaimer, which is um, although I've been studying um, the neural control of movement and, and, and motor control for well, 30 years uh, now, um, I've only actually done ever done two studies involving people under the age of 18. Um, so uh, by no means am I an, an expert in uh, motor development. Um, and uh, um, I, I don't uh, study or, or deal with, with education in any way. But, but nevertheless, um, I think, uh, hope my research will be, be interesting to, to some of you. Um, so I'll explain maybe my journey into, into studying DCD as I go along. Um, but as Spencer says, um, I'm really interested in, in um, the motor control of uh, children, children with de developmental coordination disorder um, or, or dyspraxia, as it's, it's called um, in the UK. Um, before I do that, I'll just kind of give you my perceptions of, of the importance of, of motor control in, in, in child development and in terms of kind of education and, and cognition um, and uh, intellectual ability. Um, understanding or being able to, to move uh, and learning how to move is, uh, is fundamental to humans' understanding of the properties of the environment of the world that we live in. Um, so it, it's key to be able to, to perceive things, um, whether that be the distance between objects, properties of surfaces, um, how, how the world works is, is basically a, a function of how we interact with it. Uh, and, and so in order to, to build a, an understanding um, of the world, then we need to interact with it by moving. Um, and, and this in, includes social interactions incredibly important movement is key to this in terms of um, relating to other people, um, understanding emotions, facial expressions, which all involve movement, play, um, interacting with other people in terms of physical interactions. All, all of these, again, are, are fundamental to the human experience. And it, it's worth, I think, making the point that Cognitive ability, which, uh, okay, most people um, kind of take to mean thinking and problem solving and, and understanding and perceiving things. Um, these go hand in hand with uh, movement control. Um, it's a, it's a two-way street, perceiving things, understanding, and, un, uh, and being able to interact are all part of the same learning process. Um, and so cognition cannot happen without movement. Uh, and likewise, movement cannot happen without cognition, otherwise it would be meaningless uh, and, uh, and, and, and pointless. Um, and so as we develop our ability to move, um, th then we also get a correlation information about how our different senses interact, how the different information that's provided by our vision by our, our proprioception, a sense of how our, our muscles are stretching, et cetera, uh, our vestibular system, which tells about balance. All of these involve um, or, or require some kind of um, uh, cognitive element to understand um, the, the meaning and the relevance. Uh, an important one, which is, is, is perhaps not always obvious to, to people as well, is talking about eye movement control because moving the eyes, which is a, a fundamental motor skill, is absolutely essential for, for perception uh, and cognition. We need to be able to direct our, uh, uh, um, our eyes to appropriate places in the visual world to understand what we're, we're seeing and, and perceive it. Um, and hand in hand with that, um, predictive control about how things are moving and how we're moving with respect to the environment also is, uh, um, very much dependent on, on eye movements. So that's my kind of 
starting point for this talk. Uh, and I doubt if many of you would disagree with those points, although I'll be fascinated to, to, to hear any, any comments that you might have. So that brings me on to, to DCD or Developmental Co Co Coordination Disorder, um, also known as dyspraxia. Um, and this is uh, an interesting disorder because it's, it, it, I think, under under researched and under diagnosed. Um, um, and it's estimated, or recent estimates, it's, it probably affects up to five to six percent of the population, and, and that's probably a conservative estimate. We're probably talking um, uh, quite a, quite a large proportion more than that. Um, the, the disorder is, uh, is characterized by what people refer to as clumsy behavior. Uh, so students may be prone to trips and falls, um, that they may fumble when they, uh, they, they um, um, grasp things, um, may have problems ha with handwriting, etc. cetera. Um, and it's worth um, kind of pointing out at the offset that this is a, a, a brain disorder. It's 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 a neuro, neuroscientific in in, in origin. Um, so the, there are brain areas which are linked to DCD, including the cerebellum, basal ganglia, parietal lobe, parts of the frontal lobe. So all of those uh, parts of the uh, of the brain that are uh, involved are uh, heavily involved in in visual uh, visual guidance of movement and in uh, initiating movement. Um, so fMRI studies, of which there are some, um, and, and there's an increasing number, do show that, that children who are uh, diagnosed uh, as having DCD, their brains do function differently. Um, I should talk briefly about the, the diagnostic uh, criteria. Um, so this is just copied and, and pasted from the... Uh, the, the DSM um, version five, so that's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Um, so, so this is from the uh, American Psychiatric Association. Uh, and the definition is motor performance that is substantially below expected levels, given the person's age and previous opportunities for skill acquisition. Uh, and the examples given of coordination problems um, like poor balance, clumsy, clumsiness, dropping or, or bumping into things. Uh, and this is associated with marked delays in achieving uh, milestones such as walking, crawling or sitting. Um, uh, I, I read a statistic that a, a quarter of, um, of children diagnosed as having DCD never um, uh, um, crawled. Um, so, so as a developmental stage that that was missing or is missing for, for um, quite a large proportion. Um, and there's also delays in the acquisition of basic motor skills. Okay, so catching, throwing, kicking, running, jumping, all of the, the usual um, candidates. Um, so the second uh, criteria is that the disturbance in that first criteria is uh, or significantly and persistently interferes with ADLs, so daily living. I've underlined academic achievement because that's probably um, relevant to, to many of the, of the audience. Um, so this is something which uh, these motor problems have an impact on the quality of life and their ability to function uh, and also what happens in the classroom. Uh, onset of symptoms is usually early de developmental period, although most um, children aren't diagnosed until after they're, they're already at school. Um, and the, the criterion D is, is that the deficits are not better explained by intellectual disability or visual impairment or are not attribu attributable to um, diagnosed neurological conditions such as cerebral palsy, hemiplegia, muscular dystrophy, etc. That's not to say that there, that there aren't um, uh, associated problems with intellectual um, uh, function or with visual function, um, but uh, the, the, the criteria or criterion here is that uh, the, the motor skill deficits 
can't be better explained by these than, than, the, uh, um, than the diagnosis for DCD. I pulled this from uh, a very nice website, which is the Dyspraxia Foundation um, UK, which is, is, a, is a charity. Um, uh, although this doesn't, uh, this isn't taken from any particular scientific document, but th these are um, basic uh, descriptions of behaviour, and all of these um, behaviours have been documented in, in the literature as being uh, uh, significant markers of, of the, the condition. Um, so they include things such as anxious and easily distracted. Anxious is an important one for me because that's going to form the kind of basis of the uh, of the science I'm going to present in a little bit. Um, avoids PE and games, um, does badly in class, um, poor attention span, can't copy from the blackboard well, um, unable to remember following instructions. So clearly, this is even though it's a motor disorder, there, there are large ramifications for for behaviour in the classroom, which seriously affects the, 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 the child's ability to, to learn effectively. And it's also worth pointing out, this isn't just a, a childhood problem, okay? These are problems persisting to adulthood uh, for many, um, and there's a developing uh, amount of research which is, which is looking at adults with DCD. Um, so these aren't problems which, which you necessarily grow out of, okay? This is a kind of a persistent, um, issue that uh, can can um, carry on into into adulthood. It's also worth mentioning that DCD is doesn't always or doesn't usually present as an independent um, condition. That there's, there's comorbidities. That it goes hand in hand often with um, ADHD in particular, um, but also um, dyslexia. Um, autistic spectrum um, uh, disorders and Asperger's. So this can make it more difficult, obviously for, for, the, for the child, but, but also for the um, clinician or for the teacher or for the researcher, trying to work out um, kind of uh, what's going on um, in terms of, uh, of DCD. Um, so it's, uh, it's not a straightforward um, disorder to, to study because there are lots of different um, factors and, and, and confounds and you're often dealing with uh, you know, potentially um, several comorbidities uh, which are expressing themselves um, whenever you, you, you're trying to study um, behaviour. In terms of diagnosis, um, the path through the NHS is usually through GP referral, which will then go to a paediatrician or an occupational therapist um, or a clinical psychologist. Um, and they will um, have, you know, or make their own assessment based on, on, on um, what they're presented with. But a key tool that's, that's commonly used or most commonly used is something called the, the Movement Assessment Battery Test for Children, or MABC. Um, and so this is a, um, basically a test of, of motor skill involving things such as asking children to, to put coins into a money box or, or throw a target onto a mat, um, simple tests of balance, standing on, on one foot, etc. So there's a, a series of physical tests, um, but also a questionnaire which um, probes uh, things such as the impact on the school environment, impact on the home, um, and um, social behaviour, uh, social uh, and behavioural um, factors. Um, and and that, uh, that test then produces a score, and depending on, on uh, what the, the, the child gets in that, that score, that then that they can be diagnosed as being DCD. Um, so that's, is a, this is a, the, the test that, uh, that I've used um, in, in terms of um, recruiting uh, participants. Um, and, and so I'll be referring back to this um, for the, uh, as I present my data. 
Okay, another thing which, which also complicates the uh, the situation um, is is the fact that anxiety uh, and mental health problems generally are highly prevalent um, with, with children and adults with DCD. Um, so I've just kind of pulled out a, a few um, kind of examples from from the literature um, and from um, uh, various. Um, other sources. Um, so for example, the Dyspraxia Foundation found that 40% of um, children, in this case adolescents with DCD, um, felt anxious all the time. So this is a generalized anxiety about life in general. Um, but there's also evidence generally that motor skills or, or deficits um, in, in motor skills in infancy can be predicted of later symptoms of anxiety and depression at school age. Um, Self-report studies have shown that um, uh, people are aware uh, that, uh, that, that, that they have problems in, in daily activities and th this causes anxiety and they even make the link between perceived um, problems um, and anxiety related to, to moving around and, and, and um, linking that to increasing chances of tripping and falling. Um, and their self report anxiety pertaining to mobility having this negative impact on safety. So, unsurprisingly, if, uh, if you're a child with a motor deficit, you're going to be anxious about moving, uh, especially in PE type situations. But this kind of pervades, it seems, to, to many aspects of life. Uh, the children can be generally anxious and, and anxiety is going to affect their, their behavior and the choices that they make and it's going to affect their ability to, to, to learn um, and, uh, and function effectively. And so coming around then to, to back to my story a little bit and why I, I, I'm, I'm giving a talk on DCD since as I said before this is something which traditionally up until now in my career I haven't um, kind of moved into to child development and, 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 and associated disorders. I'm interested in, uh, or have been for many years, fundamentally interested in the question of, of falling over as we age. Why older adults fall uh, and what we can do to, um, to improve safety. Um, and, and the way I've approached this problem is by, by look, asking the question, okay, what, what do we know uh, about how visual information is used as people walk around? And do we see any changes in, in the way that um, older people uh, use visual information um, to guide movement? Uh, and so I've done very many studies um, using um, eye tracking equipment, which study where people look as they walk around. Uh, and uh, use biomechanical analysis to, to, to do an, give an accurate representation of how they're able to, to move, uh, avoid obstacles, walk on stairs, step into targets. I'm looking for the relationship between um, where we look and where we step, seeing if any differences in older, older adults might explain why they're, they're more likely to, to trip and fall. Um, and one task I've used a lot is, is the one that you can see on the screen. It's a simple kind of obstacle course, which you can set up in a lab where you have older adults walking and stepping into a target on the floor, which has raised edges to make it particularly, uh, uh, so you have to be very precise about where you put your feet uh, and you can put obstacles, which they, they have to um, step over. Uh, and what you see with this kind of task um, is that um, people invariably look at the place on the ground that they need to step. So in a situation where um, you have to put your foot into a target, then people invariably look into that target before, usually before they, they uh, lift their foot to step into it. Now the extent to which people look ahead depends on the context. So if there's nothing in the room apart from one part of the, the floor to be, to be avoided, then, then people may be looking you know, a couple of meters ahead. On the other hand, if you're in a situation where you have to put your foot in precise places at every step, um, then you see um, 
a, a much tighter link between the time you look and the time that you move your foot to, to reach the place or target the place that you, you're looking. And this is a very cl close coordinated process, okay? So it's, it's very similar in some ways to what you see with eye hand coordination in terms of the timing relationship between looking at a target you want to point at and the time at which you initiate the, the movement to, to that target. So this is something which um, is slightly different than thinking, okay, people look around, get information, and then initiate a stepping movement. It, this is basically linking very closely the act of an eye movement to the act of a stepping movement. Um, and the timing of this is very robust, uh, very kind of predictable in, in, in young, healthy people. And so it's, uh, I found it to be a useful way of, of probing how this kind of eye stepping coordination, this visual motor regulation may change as we age. And after I started looking at this, um, I found that depending on the, the, the person that you study, some older adults show exactly the same behavior as younger adults in terms of how they use vision to, to guide movement. But certain older adults, you see differences. And when I looked at the, the, the circumstances of those differences and, and found out more about the older adults, and a theme began to appear and it seemed, it, it transpired that anxiety or fear of falling is um, something which has come to have quite a dramatic effect on, on this coupling between looking and stepping. Um, and uh, this, all these changes in, in the relationship between um, eye and stepping movements um, caused by anxiety can be paradoxically problematic and make it more likely that that person is going to have an, an accurate step, making them more um, at more risk of, of falling and tripping. Um, so I'm just going to play this video and, and show you an example of the, the kind of task I'm talking about and the behaviour, the kind of behaviour that, that can be identified as problematic in older adults who um, are anxious. So it's, it's quite an old video, but still kind of, I think shows the, um, the, the situation quite nicely. This crosshair shows uh, where the person is looking. So they're wearing an eye tracking device, which shows the, the point of view, uh, their view of the room and also where they're looking. Uh, and this is when they're walking along and stepping into these targets on the floor. And so this is, if you like, normal behavior um, or, or kind of typical behavior for, for younger adults and uh, uh, older adults who, who don't have um, fear of falling. You see that, the, uh, that they look at the center of the target until after the foot lands and then look at the next one. This is a situation where we have an anxious older adult. They look away. Well, let me start that again. So here they look away before the foot has landed in the, in the target uh, and in this situation they end up kicking the box. And this is the behavior that, that uh, most people adopt uh, and so that it's, it, it is, uh, um, if you like, the, the most appropriate uh, way in which eye and foot are, are, are behaving together when doing this task. And so I've done various studies to, to, to kind of um, tang, uh, disentangle um, what is, is going on in, in this situation. Uh, and one theme which, which comes out is that those old, older adults who show that behavior where they look uh, away prematurely, that the, the, the normal eye foot coordination is disrupted. If you look at what they, they look at or study what they look at before they start walking, and you see that the, the low risk uh, and young people will be looking around, okay? This is before they actually reach the, the target. They might be looking at the first target, but then they're also looking at the obstacle uh, and the, the second obstacle on, on the other side of that target. If you study the same behavior in, in the older adult group who uh, are anxious uh, and, uh, and, and show the, the uh, suboptimal looking behavior of looking away early, you see something different. They seem to focus primarily on this first target 
maybe have a look at the, uh, at the first obstacle. But clearly their focus of, uh, uh, of eye movement behavior is on the first target. They seem to be fixed on this, this first hazard at the expense perhaps of, of gaining information about what's coming up. And this has the effect that uh, once they're in the process of completing that first step, they look away prematurely here to find the information, presumably that they didn't uh, gather before they started walking. And good news is that once we can identify this behavior, at least in a lab setting, then we can give instructions um, which can be used to change behavior. And that seems to have an associated improvement in, in uh, their stepping accuracy. You can simply tell people to uh, not look away early and, and keep looking at the, uh, the target until the foot lands. But then again, that, that can have detrimental uh, effects on the ability to, to do this, which is to, to step successfully over these other targets. But the, the best solution we found so far is to ask people to do this before they start walking, is to look at the environment, decide or, or kind of be, make themselves uh, feel more confident about what they have to achieve uh, before they start walking. And that has an effect, at least in the lab, of um, promoting the behavior we want to see in terms of our movements and stepping, and has a corresponding, uh, or produces a corresponding improvement in their stepping accuracy. So this is an example of how anxiety or fear of falling can have an effect on visual motor control and visual motor behavior, which um, has a bearing on, on, on stepping um, um, and movement performance generally. Um, and, and so when I, I heard in the talk uh, of the, the prevalence of anxiety in a population that have motor deficits, um, I was kind of interested to, to explore the, the idea that to what extent or, or is there any kind of link between the, the anxiety that, uh, that's reported in, in, in this population um, with aspects of their motor deficits? So if we had um, DCD um, children, got them to do a task similar to, similar to this, measured their, their anxiety, measured their eye movements and their stepping, would we see a similar kind of um, result? Um, and could we do anything to, to address that? So those are the research questions um, that, that, that I had um, not that long ago. This is, these are fairly recent studies. Um, the two um, papers or two studies I, I'm going to present today um, have only just recently been published um, in, in the last uh, few weeks um, in, uh, in, in um, uh, Frontiers Neuroscience. Um, so these are the research questions which, which um, which I'm interested in. Uh, and another disclaimer, this is preliminary work, even though they published papers, this is still kind of early doors um, and uh, we still have a lot to learn. Um, but uh, hopefully you, you, you'll, um, you'll find the results interesting. Um, so the questions are, do children with DCD show altered visual motor control during walking? Um, which I would expect on the basis uh, of my understanding of the, 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 the delays in, in, in development and the differences we see in the behavior. Um, but also crucially, are stepping problems, um, uh, you know, motor problems linked to, to any anxiety or fear of falling that, that, that might, it might have, which is also um, self-reported um, a lot in the literature. Uh, and this study was, um, only made or made possible by the Waterloo Foundation, which is a, a UK-based charity who um, uh, who fund various um, uh, fields of research, but, but in, in particular research into child um, development uh, and DCD is, is something that they, they encourage um, applications to study. Um, so this is, uh, I present, in order, basically, of the, of the studies that, uh, that uh, or the order that we did the studies, um, as I said, this is, is out now in frontiers in human neuroscience. 
um, the spoiler alert, the uh, the title kind of gives away the uh, gives away the uh, game a little bit, but I'll uh, I'll guide you through it. Um, so we interested in, in studying uh, two groups of, of children. Uh, we, we wanted um, children with uh, DCD. Um, we weren't so much worried about whether they had a, a formal diagnosis for, for DCD, since we, we did our own tests um, using the, um, the movement uh, uh, um, ABC uh, um, test, which is the one that um, uh, clinicians rely on predominantly. Um, so we either had uh, children who, who were diagnosed with DCD or whose parents um, suspected strongly that the, they, they did have DCD, um, and a group of um, age-matched, um, uh, typically uh, developing children. Fairly small numbers, so about 20 in, in each group, um, a mix of male and female. They weren't particularly young, young children, so the mean age was around 10 or 11. Um, so uh, age range from eight, eight to 15. So, so mostly kind of pre-adolescent in, in terms of age. Um, but in terms of their, um, the, the, uh, the scores on the uh, diagnostic test for, for test for DCD, you can see that typically the developed got a score of 53% on average with a very large kind of range. Um, and the, uh, the DCD group, much, much lower. Um, now bear in mind that lower than 15% is, um, is the usual cutoff for diagnosis of, of DCD. Um, less than 5% means that they have severe motor problems. Um, and, and clearly we were kind of managed to get a, a group that um, fell very much into that category. The reason that we have a separate column over here is that um, for, for various reasons, we couldn't analyze the eye movement behavior, the gaze behavior of um, a, a few participants um, for, for, for technical reasons and for the, the, the fact that the, the, the children didn't, wouldn't tolerate them. Or, or wouldn't uh, uh, you know, follow the, the instructions to make sure that we got nice data. And so I'm just going to play another video now of the of the of the task, um, which also kind of shows what we what we measured. Um, so we used a, a motion analysis system, a, a, a Vicon system, to produce a 3D picture of the of their body movements and uh, allowed us to accurately quantify their stepping um, uh, accuracy. Um, and we also had a, an eye tracker. So I'll just press play. Um, so the little crosshair, little circle with a thing, uh, the uh, um, plus inside shows where they were looking. And uh, the uh, I'll just play this again. And you can see on, on the right hand side, they're moving their head up and down at the start and then making the, uh, <clears throat> making the movement. So we're using quite um, sensitive and, and, and high tech equipment. Um, the, the motion analysis system gives a very detailed uh, picture of, uh, of movement capability. Uh, so we can measure kind of accuracy to within a couple of millimeters in terms of where the center of the foot was placed with respect to the box. Um, and, uh, and likewise, we, with the gaze tracker, we can get an accurate indication of where and when they were looking at the, at the target. So uh, I should say we did several trials. So there were the three conditions um, when it was just the target by itself, uh, a target followed by one obstacle or a target followed by, by two obstacles. Um, and, uh, and we were primarily interested in terms of the biomechanics for, for this study, simply how accurately they put their foot in, in, in the center of, uh, of the box. Um, and we weren't surprised to find that there were differences in, in terms of um, um, how accurately the, the two groups performed. Um, so this 
picture um, here, these spots show the, the average position of the foot in the box for the different participants. And the kind of pink uh, blobs are the DCD group and uh, the green blobs are the, uh, the, the typically uh, developing uh, group. Um, and you can see irrespective of how many obstacles were, were, were uh, put down, then zero being the ideal where it's, the foot is perfectly in the center of the target. Um, you can see that the, uh, the, the TD group came close to that. Um, DCD group went a million miles away, probably in fact about a centimeter and a half um, on average further behind the, or behind the center of the box, but still a fairly good performance, um, but systematically less accurate and different than the, uh, the, the, the T group, TD group. Um, we were a little bit surprised that, uh, that the overall performance was as good as it was in the, um, in the DCD group, um, but you can see there is quite a large spread of values in terms of individuals. So, so unsurprisingly, some um, individuals were, were much worse and ended up on average putting the foot um, quite a long way behind the center of the target and end up hitting the edge of the, uh, of the target. Um, but some of them did, did very well. So that, that ticks first box, which is that this is the first study that, that has looked at stepping accuracy um, in children with DCD. Um, so even though um, other uh, motor skills uh, ha have been assessed, this is the first time that, that, that we've, we've shown that they do walk somewhat differently um, in, in terms of how accurately they put their feet. What was surprising though, was that we didn't see any differences in their eye movement behavior. Um, so um, this basically shows the time at which they looked away from that first target to, to look up at uh, any obstacles um, when present. Um, you'd expect kind of um, sensible behavior and normal behavior to be looking at the center of the box until after the foot lands, which will mean that you get a positive value on this bar. And all of the uh, groups did this um, irrespective of whether there was different obstacles uh, following the, the initial target or not. We would have predicted and would have expected that if um, the um, DCD group were behaving like anxious older adults, then you would expect to see this down here somewhere. And then they'd look away before the foot landed into the target. Uh, and that might then explain and correlate with, with changes in their, their stepping accuracy. But we didn't see that, um, which um, we, we found kind of interesting and a little bit surprising. So we couldn't identify any difference in terms of the, the looking behavior between the two groups. And this table of lots and lots of numbers, which uh, I'm sure you're squinting to look at as much as I am at the moment, basically shows no effect in all of the different measures that we, we, we made of their, their looking behavior in terms of the amount of time they spent looking at different aspects of the, uh, of the, um, the task and, and the lab um, as they perform the task. But the interesting one I think in this table is the one at the bottom in which we measured the, or attempted to measure the anxiety of the, uh, of the detail of children. Um, and the way we did this was using um, a called, something called a, a fear thermometer, which was, uh, um, established by a Canadian research group, um, which basically kind of taps into the state anxiety about a particular context. So in this situation, we'd ask them, how anxious are you about the, the task that you're, you're doing? Um, whether you're kind of cool and happy with that, as uh, Mr. Cool guy at the bottom here, or kind of run for the hills, scared, um, which would be 10 on the, on the thermometer. Um, and if you look at the, the scores for, for the, the groups, then you see pretty much they're all down Mr. Cool level, okay? They're all feeling kind of uh, uh, pretty relaxed about it, or at least they report that um, with a, a level down to um, one, two, two um, for the DCD kids, and, and really no difference in on certainly no statistical difference in the development uh, developing group 
Although you can see that these twos here are quite a bit, you know, a fair bit higher than the, the, the 1.2, but we're still talking very much towards the cool end of things here. Uh, and it's certainly nowhere near here. <clears throat> so, so kind of uh, a mixed bag there. I, I think uh, it's a useful study to show that we can identify stepping problems um, uh, and, and uh, um, identify stepping accuracies in a DCD group by using that kind of task. But it's clear that uh, either our, our fear thermometer doesn't work um, or that the task wasn't really difficult enough to, to, to challenge the, the DCD kids. Um, it might be a combination of the two. Um, so we kind of took that information on board and, and then started a new study, which uh, is a motor task, which is a lot more challenging, which is stair walking. Uh, and stair negotiation in, in DCD um, hasn't been studied in, in these kind of lab-based studies in terms of um, uh, um, looking uh, precisely at their, at, at their performance or ability, but it is anecdotally something which comes up again and again when, when reading papers and, and, and talking, to, um, talking to parents. Um, so there's lots of anecdotal evidence and, and um, uh, qualitative evidence in the literature that children with DC struggle negotiating stairs. I mean, it's mentioned in, in, in the, um, the, the, the DSM criteria. Um, so, you know, examples of, of behavior such as leaving class early to avoid busy staircases. Um, so we want, were interested to, to actually do a lab-based study to, to look at um, the biomechanics of stair walking and compare it between um, um, uh, DCD and, and, and TD um, groups. Um, and also, again, revisit this question about anxiety, which is likely to be much higher, we, we, we predicted in, in this, for this kind of task. Um, and also, um, again, uh, try to look at gaze behavior to see if we can see any differences in visual motor control, which might um, explain DCD. Um, so I'm just going to show a couple of videos as an example. So again, this is uh, the Vicon data, which has drawn a nice skeleton on, on it for a kind of dramatic effect. Um, here you can see an example of a, of a DCD child walking down the stairs. So this is just one, one participant. Um, as you can see, fairly slow. I mean, as I said, I study old adults and stair walking in old adults a lot. Uh, and I've seen, you know, 90 year olds who, who walk down a staircase uh, with more confidence than, than, than this person. Just to compare that with a, um, um, a child from the other group, that's the kind of, of behavior you expect to see for a kind of nine or 10 year old walking down the staircase. So it's clear that, that there are some differences there and we wanted to kind of formalize that. Um, and we also studied gaze behavior um, as, uh, as participants perform the task. So we could get an idea about where they were looking and when, how far they were looking ahead in terms of which part of the staircase, et cetera. Um, so again, this is a different paper, but again, same, same journal, um, it came out two days ago. So this is really hot off the press or a few days ago, according to that. Um, and in terms of what we measured, again, we had an eye tracker to measure um, gaze behavior, a motion analysis system to, to measure the biomechanics in terms of the, the, the movement characteristics. And we also had an um, intelligent staircase, um, which has force plates in it. Um, you can also change the dimensions of the staircase uh, if, if needed. We didn't use that for this study. Um, and it also has an instrumented handrail so that we know not only if people touch the handrail, but, but how much force um, uh, they, they apply to it, um, which, which uh, can give you some additional important information about uh, um, uh, behavior and, and, and stability, etc. Um, Pretty much the same pool of, of participants before, a few differences, but the same general um, 
characteristics in terms of age um, and, and uh, same kind of scores on, on the MABC. So again, we're, we're, talk, we're, we're studying a group who scored really quite uh, poorly on, on the MABC and clearly fall into the, the DCD category, um, whereas the, the TD did not. Another thing that we, we tried with this study is to, in addition to asking the, the children using the fear thermometer, how scared are you about what you're about to do? Um, we also um, uh, polled their, their, their parents just to, to get an idea of whether they felt um, or how confident their parents were that their, their um, children will be able to um, go down a staircase in, in under different circumstances. So just normal walking uh, on the stairs, walking quickly, not using handrails. How well, how confident are you they'll be able to recover from a loss of balance and, uh, and not fall down the stairs? And these were quite striking in, in terms of the, the DCD or the parents of, of children with DCD, both for ace ascent, walking up and walking down the stairs, had really quite low levels of confidence in, in their ch child's ability to, to do it safely. So we're talking 40% for, for walking down the stairs compared with 94% of, of parents of uh, typically developing um, children. So it's pretty clear that parents don't think their children are very good at, 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 at uh, walking on stairs. Uh, and, and again, this is the first time that this kind of information has been has been um, quantified. So um, hopefully that will be of, of use to people. OK, so in terms of the, the results, um, Apologies for the, for the, the number of, uh, of pictures on the slide. And I also consider the fact that I'm probably running over time, um, rambling on. Um, so I'll kind of uh, maybe just uh, kind of highlight the, the, the key points from this, um, which is DCD kids generally were slower. This is just stair ascent, walking up the stairs um, uh, uh, first. Um, they were slower. Um, as shown by the, the time it took them to do it uh, and uh, the time um, taking each step. But generally, in terms of their toe clearance, so this is how close the toe comes to the edge of the stairs as they climb, which is clearly important because if it's too close, then that, that can cause a, a trip and a stumble. Pretty much similar between groups. Um, although the importantly though, you, if you look at the DCD group, which is the, the, the pink spots, the variability in that toe clearance is, is elevated, uh, significantly so. So even though the uh, overall toe clearance was, was similar, the fact that there's more variability means that there is a more chance that the, uh, the uh, DCD um, group um, would contact uh, um, a step at some point. In terms of the uh, fear thermometer, um, basically, we got the same kind of result. This is for stair ascent. We got the same result as for, for the previous study, which is children were reporting that they weren't scared. They were cool as, as, as a cucumber um, when, when asked how they felt about doing the stairs. And I should say at this point, they were wearing a safety harness. And also, if you look at the handrail usage and, and compare that between groups, you see that the typically developing children use the handrail. Um, uh, only two of them out of 16 of the, of the group use the handrail at all, and both of them use the handrail for all five trials. But 14 out of 19 of the, of the DCD children use the handrails, um, and then 10 use them on every single trial. So they weren't scared. Um, but there were still differences in their performance, and, and that seemed to evolve a lot around handrail usage, which might explain why they, 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 there wasn't any, any, any changes in their overall token, but still doesn't, uh, you know, there's, there's still this, this issue of variability, which, uh, again, I can't rule out as being something which is a consequence of using the handrail. In terms of their gaze behavior, there's no difference, basically. I'll, I'll, uh, this is kind of a heat map, not dissimilar from, I'm sure, the coronavirus pandemic 
a map of the UK that that, that uh, we, we've been shown uh, on a regular basis. But this shows how far ahead um, the, uh, the the two uh, groups uh, looked on average when they did the uh, the task, and they're very much similar. So it's stair ascent; they're looking in the same places at, at the same times and to the same extent. The only difference we found was that the DCG group spent a bit more time, or significantly more time, looking at the handrail. Okay, so moving on to stair descent. So of course, this is a much more precarious situation from, uh, from, a, from a balance perspective. The implications for, for falling or tripping when you're walking downstairs is much greater than walking not, uh, upstairs. Um, and uh, we did see some differences, again, in walking speed, um, which uh, again, isn't surprising considering the video we saw at the start. This time we did see some differences in um, the, the perceived anxiety or the reported anxiety of the students. Um, uh, so the DCD kids had a kind of raised eyebrow uh, expression on, on average, whereas the TD group uh, was still cool. So the, at this stage, the, or during this part of the task, there was a report, uh, a significant increase in reported anxiety. Um, and similar uh, uh, for, the, for the ascent, uh, we see again, most of the DCD children use the handrail, most of the TD ones didn't. And again, looking at the, the variability this time of the heel clearance as they're walking down the stair, uh, again, this was quite elevated in uh, the, uh, the DCD group which is putting them at greater risk of stepping on or, or, or catching their heel on the edge of the stairs, even though they're using the handrail. Um, and we did see some differences in their, their, their visual behavior in terms of their visual search. So differences in gaze behavior. Uh, and uh, I'll just give you the, the bottom lines. As I, I don't want to run out of time here. Basically, they were looking further ahead they spent more time looking at the bottom of the staircase when they were halfway down it than the, uh, the, the TD group. Um, uh, and this was true of, of the, uh, the middle and the, and the bottom of the staircase. So there is a change in, in the way they use vision. Um, but again, it's the, the, you know, the, the, the caveat is that they were doing the task in, in, a, in quite a different way. Um, so this just shows basically that the graph to, to demonstrate that or quantify that in terms of how far we're looking ahead and there's differences between the groups. And this is a, a correlation, significant, but fairly, fairly unimpressive correlation. But nevertheless, it, it does suggest this, uh, the, the extent to which they're looking ahead as they walk down the staircase is, is dependent on, on the self-reported um, anxiety. So just to summarize then, the, the children with DCD uh, in, in the tasks that, that I um, that we studied uh, do show difference in visually guided stepping, both during obstacle negotiation and, and, and stair walking. Um, and the, the differences did put them at a greater risk of tripping and falling. They were less accurate in where they put their foot into the target and they were, had more variability in, the, in their foot clearance going up and down the stairs. There is some evidence of changes to visual motor control, in other words, where they were looking when they did the task, but only when the task is uh, was made very challenging in, in terms of stair descent. And so there is some evidence that the, the anxiety or the fear of falling that they reported has some kind of modulatory uh, effect on their, on their visual motor control. So I'm going to finish off just by kind of now, my kind of take home message, I, I guess, uh, f from what I've learned so far doing these studies is that, uh, and from my work on, on with older adults, is a substantial interplay between cognitive factors such as anxiety and, and motor control, which can may contribute towards problems um, in children um, with DCD, but not only problems with their movement, but this is likely to have an impact on, on other aspects of their development and education. Um, 
Uh, and so I, I think it is important that we understand and use these kind of sensitive measures to get a, a good handle on, on what the motor deficits are um, and um, how that relates to, to anxiety and, and, and mood state um, so that we can understand um, these motor problems and contextualize it in, in terms of um, performance and behavior not only when they're walking on stairs and, and, and uh, out and about in, in, in the real world, but also obviously in the classroom uh, and how the, the anxiety and, and their motor problems may, may impact on their educational experience. Okay, thank you. I'll stop sharing my screen. Well, there's still people in the room, that's fantastic. That's, uh... <laughs> thanks, thanks a lot. Mark. I'll hand back to you, Spencer. No, thank you so much for your time. That was great. Um, I am mindful, obviously, that we are running a wee bit uh, longer than usual. So I've been monitoring the chat then, and I'll just amalgamate a couple of the questions. So um, a number of questions are asking you from your experience of working in um, stepping behaviour. Um, have you considered um, or do you think there's any um, impact if you vary, if you had some variations in the the stairs that people were walking up and down. So there was like different stair heights, different size of the, the footwell, uh, and also whether or not the environment was variable in some way. So if you manipulated kind of variability in stair walking on a trial to trial basis, would that impact your data? Yeah, that's an interesting point. Um, I mean, we, we have done some studies, my colleagues with um, um, biomechanics um, that have, have changed the properties of a staircase uh, had older people walking up and down it um, with an eye tracker on. Um, they only made small changes, um, but significant ones, like a, a, a centimeter or so. Uh, and interestingly, um, people didn't perceive them. Um, they didn't notice that there were any difference. Uh, um, and uh, the, interestingly, younger people made adaptations without noticing they were doing so. Um, older people um, made less adaptations, um, which is, is clearly, you know, potentially a problem. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I agree entirely. I, I think that there, there is lots of scope to kind of make the environment more challenging and more ecologically valid in, in the lab so we can get a, you know, a better handle on, on what real world risks are. Yeah. A, uh, another question that popped into the chat from Caroline was, um, um, what was the reason you could not measure the eye movement um, or eye behavior in a large part of your sample? Uh, and therefore, um, could this sample help explain the, the guys that you couldn't measure their eye behavior then as being a problem in the eye, uh, in the coordination, divergent, unstable binocular vision, for example? Yeah, there was only actually a, a small number. It, it wasn't the majority. Um, so we, we did have gaze behavior for, for the majority of our participants. Um, it was mostly, um, you know, so, some of the, you know, these were young children. <laughs> um, some of them kind of kept knocking it, kind of taking yeah. it off. Um, some, sometimes, um, you know, to get a decent calibration, you, you need to get them to look at a certain place at a certain time to allow you to get an accurate idea of, of, of where they're looking. And so, you know, after, 15 minutes of trying to do that with a, with a, with a child was already kind of a bit hyperactive and, 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 and bored. It, 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 we decided to, to just kind of carry on without the data for that particular individual. Um, so no, I, think, I think the data that we did get uh, is representative, um, but I, I can't, I mean, it, it's true. It's a fairly small sample. And, and as you saw from the data, there's quite a lot of individual differences in, in, in behavior, both yeah. in terms of walking um, and in terms of uh, eye movement behavior. So it's, uh, I think a kind of more case study approach in, in, in certain situations may be kind of more informative or tell us more anyway. Okay, cool. I'll um, ask the audience if anybody would like to ask a question. I'll ask a question and Mark, um, just the last one then. You you mentioned from some of your data that, um, oh, sorry, I've got a hand up, Mark, so I'll pass that over to 
Caroline Wooten. Caroline? I think you're on mute. Um, yeah, yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can, can yeah. Now? Yeah, we can. Um, it was just a quick question. When you um, shared the mechanism by which they walked down the stairs, the example you gave, the DCD child was walking, I think, they started from the right foot, and then after that, they used the left foot as the lead foot the whole way down the stairs, whereas the other group of children, typically developing children, alternated their legs. So they, they weren't using, they're going right, left, right, left, right, left. Was this, that just a sort of a one-off example, or was that typical for most of the sample? I, I wouldn't say it was typical, but we, we didn't we didn't differentiate for 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 um, this study in, in terms of. Uh, I mean, the example was an extreme one. I gave <laughs> I gave the worst case uh, scenario to, to show that we we, we can see, see differences. Um, um, we, we asked the children generally to go step over step. Um, so that we could compare. Um, so the, the example I gave was actually a very poor example because that showed a kind of more than one, one step on, 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 on uh, one step. Um, so we did ask the, uh, ask the children to, um, so we could compare. Um, we did ask them to walk down in normal one step, etc. I mean, it's something you see, a, it's a strategy that very anxious or very frail individuals use is uh, kind of two feet on each step. Um, as they go down, but that, that's not what we used in this study. We, we actually specified that the children need to walk step, over step, if you see what I mean. Okay, thanks, Mark. I'll, I'll take the liberty to ask the one question from the chat, because it was something similar to the one that I was going to ask you, uh, which was, um, and you've done, I know that you've done some of this work previously, a uh, question by Lynn um, asked whether or not you think um, instructions to DCD group on where to look might help with the um, stair descent? Yeah, I mean, that, that's the plan that we had when we did this study initially. I was like, we kind of, I, I guess, a bit naively um, expected to see something very similar that, that we'd see in, in older adults for, for the target stepping, for example, and, and, and show that we could intervene in some way to kind of uh, promote um, safer and, and, and more optimal kind of eye stepping behavior. Um, so that was actually written into the grant. But we, we didn't do it in the end because there was no point because they didn't behave uh, differently in, in that particular study. The stair one, it's, it's a little bit trickier because it, it, it's not, stair walking is, is quite different than target stepping. Um, we're not sure that the, the way that vision information is being used is, is the same. Uh, and so, for example, there's, there's, there's some evidence to show that people aren't necessarily using vision about the position of the steps each time as they walk down, especially in a, in a staircase which is uniform in, in design. Um, then um, people may not be using vision specifically about stair edges to guide the placement of each foot. They can be using vision for for balance information in terms of self motion and an optic flow to help them kind of make sure that they're balancing correctly as they walk down. Um, so the, the it's uh, how they're using vision information on stairs and how that relates to the stepping still haven't been established um, because it's uh, it's a slightly more complicated scenario than walking along the flat and putting your foot on a single target. Um, so, so I can't say what is good behavior and what's not. I can't tell you right now that looking further ahead when you're walking down a staircase is a bad idea and will make you, um, uh, you know, less safe. Um, so that's still work that we're doing to try to establish how you're using vision, what you're using it for, uh, and trying to work out what an optimal kind of strategy might be to promote safety. Okay, perfect. I think that's about it. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Good luck with your future work and grant applications. And hopefully the Peak District isn't too wet, albeit it's wet down here in London. No, thanks, right, for, so, thanks for the opportunity. I just did forget to put up my acknowledgement slide because I went out of time. So I just want to acknowledge basically that, uh, that the work done by, by Johnny Parr, who was a postdoc on the, on, on the study, he's now um, a lecturer at MMU. Uh, and also my collaborators, Greg Wood, who also from MMU, uh, and Richard Foster from the uh, Biomechanics Group at LGMU. 
um, who did, uh, did, did majority of the work on uh, on this project uh, and so it's important they get they get the credit but thanks very much for the opportunity to present and uh, I'll, I'm, my email is uh, um, well I, I don't know if maybe you can post that I can do that um, I, I'm happy to, to you know follow up any questions by, by email with people um, and uh, thanks very much for, for your attention okay thank you take care thanks a lot bye